Thanks for letting me join you and uh, chat with you a bit tonight. Um, I have a lot of respect for the CFA designation. It's a really important and well-respected credential, and I've had a ton of fun over the years actually being involved with public companies that have sponsored the research challenge, and I've been a judge a few times, and that's been a really wonderful experience too. So I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about Royal Gold, but uh, in talking to Garrett a little bit about what would be relevant to this audience, we thought we'd talk a lot, a little about Royal Gold, but a lot about our investment process. Because like most of you in the room, or all of you in the room, I guess, uh, we're an investor. And we invest primarily in gold, that is our investment of choice, but we thought it'd be interesting to talk about how we make our decisions and um, some of the returns that we've been able to generate over the years. I'll also do a brief uh, case study of a company called Rubicon Minerals that we've made an investment in last year. And uh, that's also a company that Garrett covers, so it's an interesting um, overlap between Royal Gold and uh, GSA. So there may be a couple forward-looking statements in my comments, and as a public company, we have to give you, um, obviously, the disclaimer that there will be some of those, and if you um, are interested, we have filed all of our disclosures um, with NNR 10K. So about Royal Gold. So we are, um, we've been in business since 1981, and we're in the royalty and streaming business. So we purchase pieces of production um, from mines, so usually gold, uh, and that can be from a primary copper mine, a primary polymetallic mine, or a primary gold mine. Um, but we're just like a banker, a uh, project finance banker in that sense. Instead of taking principal and interest, we take a piece of production. That piece of production is life of mine, and that's where our investment strategy gets really interesting. We've been in business since 1981. Uh, we actually started out in the oil and gas business, and when that um, when oil kind of bottomed in the late 80s, early 90s, we transitioned into metals and have been there ever since. And we've got 20 employees and a $4.5 billion market cap, and uh, I have tried in vain to find a company with a higher market cap per employee and have not found one yet. So um, you are looking at 5% um, of the company right here. So uh, we try to run our business really lean. So you're looking at investor relations, human resources, and a member of our investment committee. Uh, this is an interesting chart that I thought I'd share with you. This is, a, this is a chart of all the publicly traded precious metals companies. If you look, Royal Gold is actually the ninth largest in terms of market cap. There's two other gold lines on here. They're Franco Nevada and Silver Wheaton. Those are two Canadian domiciled royalty and streaming companies that are in the same business we are in. And there's basically three of us. Now, if you ran this chart a decade ago, well, first of all, Royal Gold would be the only one on here. Um, but if you ran it a decade ago, we'd be way at the end of that list. If you ran it five years ago, we'd be like somewhere towards the end. What we've seen is that the returns to the royalty and streaming companies have been really meaningful over the last few years. Our market caps have increased substantially over that period of time. And now we actually are generating a lot of the best returns in the business. And the market's really invested that confidence in us. And so in return, we try to be really good stewards of capital. And so uh, we make decisions very carefully um, with the sense that we want to maintain this position and hopefully move a little bit further up the curve as our objective. So what is the royalty and streaming business? So there's two ways to do what we do. The first thing we can do is we can put an upfront payment in place in exchange for a piece of production from a mine, life of mine. Really simple and really attractive from, a, um, from an ownership standpoint because um, that royalty will change hands whenever the mine changes hands. For example, we made an investment in Gold Corp's Penasquito mine in the mid-1990s, and we paid $100 million for that investment. It was for 2% of all the, all the metal at the mine, which is gold, silver, lead, and zinc. And that mine changed hands six times before it actually began production. Our royalty was unaffected in every transition of ownership. Uh, since it began producing uh, a few years ago, we've already recovered our investment. The mine's got 11 years of mine life left. That's the kind of beauty of a royalty investment. It really, and we have no further um, requirement to put any more money into that royalty. So it's a wonderful long annuity cash flow stream. A stream's a little bit different. Um, in a stream case, we put in an upfront payment, and in exchange, we get the right to buy metal at a certain predefined price, which is usually a substantial discount to where the metal is trading. For example, we will pay you $100 million for the right to buy 10% of your gold at $400 an ounce. This is a benefit for the counterparty because it is more tax efficient. Um, the counterparty can actually account for that as deferred revenue, and it allows them to be 
able to manage it better than a royalty sale, which is really just going to be taxed as a sale of an asset. Kelly, yes. I'm sorry. Uh, Anna, Anna Coyo? Yeah. Is, that's a stream, right? That's a royalty. <coughs> okay. But yeah. is it, it's a percentage of gold that you're not paying anything for, so therefore it's a royalty? Correct. Correct. So we actually are, we actually get 75% of the gold from Andacoyo. Yeah. So uh, that's one of our largest royalties. That's actually on Tech Resources project down in Chile. Uh, so it's really appropriate for any stage of the project life cycle. So we'll do these deals um, for a royalty, for example. We'll buy a royalty directly from a company. There can also be original prospectors that may have royalties for sale. There may be um, folks that were involved in JVs uh, when the, when the uh, mine was originally put together that may have retained a royalty and they may have it for sale. So we come by those in a variety of ways. Streams are a little bit different in the sense that um, those are typically contracted directly with our counterparties. What's interesting about a stream is that it's a purchase and sale agreement with the counterparty and we also get some level of security. For example, we may ask for a um, first priority interest in the gold at the mine. Um, we may ask that less than $100 million be senior to us. Um, usually there's some type of security interest associated with the stream, which you know, benefits us as well as the, the counterparty and makes us feel a little bit more aligned as partners. Because unlike a royalty, um, a stream won't necessarily change hands when the business changes hands. Um, it's a little bit more of a contract between two parties. Why does this unique business exist and why does it really seem to exist in streaming in particular, exist in mining? And the reason is that this, this chart hopefully gives you a sense, and this might be why some of you have been interested in gold in and out over the years and not. It's really the capital intensive nature of gold mining. Um, as you know, it can take anywhere between four and 10 years um, for a greenfields mine to, to go into production. Um, and along the way, there's all these milestones related to exploration, permitting, um, feasibility, and, and various economic assessments that need to occur. It's extremely complex business. And a lot, each step along the way, there's an opportunity for Royal Gold to get involved as it gets de-risked. Um, the capital generating piece, I know it looks like a really small part of the picture here, but actually it can go on for about 30 years. So if you can get an investment in at the right time um, with the right project, it can be um, really beneficial in terms of returns to the company. That a lot of times when people um, think about gold mining, they think it's just a guy with a pickaxe out in a out in you know a mountain location trying to pull some gold out, and it's actually much more complex and difficult than that. And it requires extensive analysis. Uh, and these, uh, particularly the Canadian securities laws, require a lot of disclosure and a lot of detail out publicly. Um, so if you look at that, you have to imagine that we do due diligence on probably. Um, 100 projects a year, and with each of those, there are several books worth of data that are combed through um, and vetted and site tours and due diligence and an am amazing amount of work that goes into uh, whether or not you want to invest in one of these projects um, the way we are. Because unlike most of you, where you can exit your investments, we're long. We never exit an investment. Once we make an investment, uh, Royal Gold is there for the life of mine. So with no ability to exit, we have to make sure that we're making good decisions and we're assessing risks very carefully. Yeah. So what's the average main life we're kind of collecting uh, the mines in the portfolio? You know, in our portfolio, it's, it's, about, it's a little over 20 years is the average mine life. Um, a brand new gold mine today might be between 10 and 15 year mine life, but like a polymetallic mine that's primarily copper that may have some gold on it, those have a much longer life closer to 30. And that's kind of our bread and butter business is taking gold byproducts off of primary uh, polymetallic mines. Great question. So this is another, um, it, you know, another slide that sort of answers why does our business exist. Um, it exists because uh, there's been quite a dry spell for raising money in the mining business the last few years. You'll see that the market for equity has uh, definitely dried up a bit, as has the market for converts. And that's kind of our two biggest competitors. It's really not the two other companies in our business, Franco Nevada and Silver Wheaton, because if you combine our two companies, our three companies, if you will, it's less than 1% of the total amount of mining finance um, that, that, um, that goes into, into play every year. Uh, so we're certainly not competing with Franco and, and Silver Wheaton, but we are competing with debt and equity. So here's, here's a deep dive if you're interested in understanding how streaming finance would benefit a shareholder of a company um, that is looking to finance, a mining company that's looking to finance its expansion. So if you're out in the market today and you want to raise, um, you want to raise money, 
you're going to pay about 12%. You're going to have about a 12% discount on an equity raise. Uh, what we can do is, in a, this is a completely hypothetical situation, but compared to that equity, what we can do is we can offer you a stream. And we can give you that amount of capital that you want to raise. We'll take 12% of the production, but we'll pay you $400 an ounce for that production. So you still get some cash flow from it. Um, you can book that as deferred revenue, and you can get the tax benefits from doing so, as opposed to just booking, um, having the whole thing be revenue and just raising equity. If you do that, your operating cash flow per share is, is going to be lower, certainly, with the stream case, because obviously you're giving up some of that production. But it's a, it's a better operating cash flow per share than if you just went out and diluted the company by 12%. And also, every single ounce of additional gold that you find is going to be spread across that larger shareholder base, which is not the case if you do a stream. The stream will still be subject to our interest, but the still the per share value will be higher. This is another example where I tried to show you discreetly what the debt case would be versus the equity case versus the stream case. And in this case, you can see as well, there's a, still a little bit, you would certainly prefer to do a stream or a convert in this case. Um, and this is pretty interest rate sensitive. So if you could get something in the high, sing, if you could get something, um, you know, low single digits, um, it might be very competitive with a stream. But since most of our counterparties are not in a position where they have uh, unlimited access to the debt markets, they tend to be a, in a bit more of a distressed situation. Um, it isn't really a very effective competitor to us. So we can again show on an NP, this is an NPV per share basis, um, that we can offer something much more advantageous than, um, than equity or what a stream could offer a company. So I'll move on to a case study. This is Rubicon Minerals, and if you look at this image here, this is a picture of the Phoenix Project. And the Phoenix Project is located in Red Lake, Ontario, which is about 250 kilometers northeast of Winnipeg, which is quite far from Boca Raton. Um, <laughs> so um, in, in many ways, quite far. What's really interesting about this mine, it's actually, the, you've, got, you've got a lot of the support facilities there, but actually a lot of the mine's actually under the lake, which is really kind of exciting. You can actually go underground under the lake. It's a high-grade um, underground mine. It's in a part of uh, northern Ontario that is a really historic mining district. Um, millions and millions of ounces of gold have been um, mined there over the years. Great mining tradition. Multiple generations of families uh, mine in this area. This was a company that needed to raise about 200 million bucks. It was about 108 million dollars to um, finish its construction, and then they needed additional working capital as well. And they were trading at about $1.59 a share. And as you can see, back to, you know, thinking back to the slide I showed earlier where it shows how long companies are consuming capital while they're in development, this company last year had 200 and I, what is that, 28, 288 million shares outstanding already with another 200 million to raise. And that's not unusual in our business. They issue a lot of equity. Um, they were net debt and they had um, a conservative new um, PEA. So that actual, um, uh, technical document you're leafing through over there is, is actually uh, probably the fourth iteration of technical documents that have been done on this project over the years. They actually took a much more conservative view to make sure that the continuity of the, um, of the veins were there and the deposit were there. And they had a trusted management team that they had just brought in because, as you might expect, Royal Gold spends a lot of time very carefully vetting a management team that's going to put a project into place. So if we look at Rubicon Minerals and what their options were, uh, they could go out and do a bot deal, a very typical Canadian bot deal where um, they're going to be charged, uh, first of all, they're going to issue stock at a discount and they're going to pay banking fees on top of it because the Canadian bank will be taking the risk um, on the issue. If you look back to a year ago when we were benchmarking these pretty carefully, um, you'll see, I don't know if I have the pointer on this or not, but um, you're looking at about a 16% discount for um, a 16% discount to where the shares were trading, you know, add on to that another 4% um, 4 fee for the bankers, and you can see that this is pretty expensive money. Uh, but to a company like Rubicon Minerals, this may be one of their only options. What Royal Gold did is that we came in and we said, okay, let us do a stream with you, but we don't want to take the whole stream, we'll, or we don't want to take the whole $200 million, we'll take a portion of that. We'll buy 6.3% of the gold uh, through the reserve life, which is about 12, 13 years. And then we'll step that down to 3% so that you don't feel like you're giving up too much of your long-term upside when you find more gold. And generally, these miners do find more gold. And that's really what provides the nice rate of return for, for us. 
Um, in exchange, we'll give you the $75 million, but we'll stage that over time. So uh, what we'll do is we'll ask for you to um, meet certain milestones. As you meet those milestones, we'll put our money in. This was a really successful story for Rubicon because what this did was was very powerful to the market. They had, it was sort of an endorsement because we had done three rounds of due diligence up to site. We have, a, our CEO is a mining engineer. We have a great team of due diligence folks that are metallurgists and geologists that came up and looked at things very carefully. We did a thorough environmental review and obviously looked at the relationships locally with the First Nations, which is also really important to this business. They went out and did their equity raise, and it was at the time they actually called us and said, would you participate if we can't get this fully covered? And we said, well, it's not our core business to buy equity in companies, but we'll, we'll participate if you need us to. They didn't need us to. The power, the, the endorsement of Royal Gold was enough to um, get plenty of subscription and participation on their, on their bot deal. So worked out great for Rubicon. They're set to begin production next year, and, or actually later this year, excuse me, and uh, we're really excited about it. So turning back to Royal Gold and sort of um, how we're making money here. So this is, a, this is a slide we like to show that shows our returns. So the light blue bar represents um, our investments. And these are, are the largest investments the company's made in its, in its life. And the light blue bar is, you'll notice the really tall one there is Mount Milligan. That's a very large investment that we actually completed about a year and a half ago. And it's just now begun production. So that's why there's such a difference between the light blue bar, which is what we've invested so far, and the dark blue bar, which is our cumulative revenue to date. The yellow triangles represent the mine life remaining. And so you can see that we've already gotten our money back on almost everything over on the right-hand side there. And it's still got a lot of mine life left. So we like to talk about how those yellow triangles are in a great place now, but the great thing about our business is that these miners are always exploring and always trying to find more ounces. And as they do, that will be subject to our stream or our royalty agreements with these companies. So when we do our due diligence, what are we focused on? We're focused on the people, the place, and the project, to make it really simple. So the quality of the project is extremely important. Um, and also, you know, we're looking at if we can get a deal with an investment rate grade rated company, obviously that's the best situation you can find yourself in. And about half the time for us, that ends up being the case. Frequently, there'll be a company like Tech Resources that um, after the Ford and Coal transaction in 2009 needed to delever, and they needed to delever quickly. And we were able to be there with cash and with the ability to buy a 75% royalty on, um, their and on the gold at their Andacoyo property. And you know, we like to get involved in those types of situations and be very opportunistic. Second one is place. So we tend to focus most of our investments on Canada, Chile, the US, and Mexico. Uh, that tends to be places where there's an established rule of law and um, support for royalty and streaming products in the overall business acumen tends to be quite good. So uh, we tend to focus on those countries, though we're not exclusive to them. And then finally, it's the project. We need to make sure that if we're taking a percentage of the uh, production, that by doing so, we don't force the project into the top quartile of a cost standpoint. Um, we don't want to take too much of any one project's economics. Um, if we do so, then they don't operate. And really, that's the only risk we run in our business is that the mines don't operate, because if they don't operate, we don't get paid. So we need to be very mindful and careful of uh, the cost model. If you look at our portfolio, and this is a good representation of it, you'll see that the average gross margin amongst our portfolio companies, um, portfolio projects rather, is 55%. And that means that you know, we should feel pretty comfortable and pretty safe that even if the metal price falls, these mines will continue to produce. And this is the number that we watch really carefully every time there's volatility in the, um, in the price of our commodities that we're exposed to. In many cases, it's a copper mine with a gold byproduct. So we watch the copper price just as closely as we watch the gold price. And the width of these benches, I should say, is, is um, related to the amount of revenue we get from each individual project. So those two, there's two really wide benches you'll see on there. The one on the top is actually our Mount Milligan investment, and the one sort of down in the 30% range is Andacoyo. So, Carly, on that side, the 578 for gold equipment ounce, that's, yeah. that's their cash cost, right? That's a cash cost, correct. Wow, that's really mm -hmm. low, right? It is really low. With the average industry is what? It's like over $1,000 low. Well, it's all in sustaining costs, but over 700 yes. 
$700 cash cost is not unusual in our business now. But this is, you know, we tend to, we do that on a gold equivalent ounce basis, but you know, what's really, what really helps us is uh, most of our mines tend to be fairly low cost mines. So we have, um, we have a lot of very uh, high margin, low cost mines where our royalty or our stream is not a burden to the, to the property, which is what we want. And that's gold equivalent, that's not even using that as a byproduct, right? It's no, it's not using it as a byproduct credit, no. No. So this is just a snapshot of our four biggest properties. If you, if you actually add these four up, this is about 63% of our total revenue. Uh, we've got Mount Milligan on top, so that's a stream. We get 52.25% of the gold from this primary copper mine up in British Columbia. Uh, it's got a mine life of 20 years and just began producing. This has been a transformative investment for Royal Gold. We invested $781 million in this um, in this mine. And we basically fronted um, uh, a great deal of the development costs. Um, in return, they have been um, really contributing increasing amounts of revenue to us because it began production about a year ago. And so we've got really nice cash flow growth over the next two years, which is really uh, a, a function of the growth that's going on at this particular mine. And then we've got our other stable portfolio of assets, which includes Texan Coil Mine that I alluded to earlier. That's got 20 years of mine life left. Um, Penasquito, that's 2% that I mentioned that earlier of all metals. Um, Gold Corp, which is a great operator, and this is a terrific asset. They're doing a, a lot of uh, work right now on unlocking copper, which we'd also have 2% of uh, what they find. And they're also trying to... Uh, enhance the entire mine plan right now. And this morning they actually came out with a press release expecting that they would substantially increase the reserves at Penasquito um, in the next year or two when they finish their feasibility study on the expansion. So again, that's just more upside and great for Royal Gold. Um, finally, Voise Bay, this is a volley project up in, um, up in um, Newfoundland Labrador area. Um, this is an unusual one. This is one that we acquired via the acquisition of another company, and this is actually a um, nickel, uh, primarily nickel copper uh, royalty that's all base metals. Not our primary business, but a nice diversifier away from gold. In terms of our, our dry powder, if you will, we have about $1.2 billion to, of liquidity to invest. Um, we're net cash, about $350 million. And we have been reasonably active over the last couple of years, but not as active as some of our peers. And I think that's really a function of our, our investment philosophy, which is that we want to achieve you know, at least a mid to high single digits rate of return um, on our investments based on the reserves alone. And then all the additional reserve conversion should be upside. With that approach, with the gold price actually, with a lot of people's mentalities, if I, if I should say, in our business being anchored more to the $1,400, $1,500 gold price environment we were in in 2011 and 2012, it had actually been um, a bit challenging to come to terms on some of the larger deals over the last year or two. So we've actually kind of been um, very careful with our investments. Now that companies are getting increasingly more and more stressed, we're actually feeling more bullish about our business and our ability to make investments. That patience has been really, I think, important to Royal Gold, and I think our shareholders have been really supportive of that. Finally, we like to balance return of capital with dividends and returns. So we've got a mandate to have a growing and sustainable dividend. We've increased our dividend each of the last 14 years. So while we consider ourselves primarily a growth company, and Mount Milligan's growth definitely gives us the ability to do so right now, uh, and we continue to layer in more and more new pieces of business and we view ourselves as a growth stock. Uh, we still think it's important in a business like ours where we keep ourselves so lean to return as much capital as we feel is, is appropriate. And so right now that's about, for us, about 60, 65 million dollars a year. So I'll wrap with this slide, which you know is, is an interesting view of how our counterparties are successful when we're successful. So these are the last three streaming deals that we've done. Uh, Rubicon that I walked you through earlier, Euromax Resources. This is a development project in Macedonia that's, that's really exciting and, and uh, actually being run by a very seasoned group of mining veterans and Thompson Creek's Mount Milligan that I've also mentioned earlier in this discussion. So, this is the share price performance the day that we announced our stream deals. And you'll see that the market really liked, liked these stream deals. And I would um, submit that if they went out and did an equity raise, um, I doubt the share price performance would have looked like this. 
So I think it shows that you know we've got a good cost of capital that we offer our counterparties. And that we also, we lower their financing risk, we lower their development risk as well, because we've done a great deal of due diligence on these companies. And then finally, you know, we're just really, we're very well aligned. So we look at, um, you know, our development and their development. We work very closely together. We occasionally even provide technical assistance to some of our counterparties if they need it. And so I think we provide a really nice safety net and occupy a, a unique space really between debt and equity. So if you think about Royal Gold, um, what we offer is really growth, and then we also offer a great deal of opportunity as well, and just quality projects. And uh, you know, when we look at our business, um, that's what we are um, most focused on and really what's made us successful to date. So with that, I'll take any questions. <coughs> Price and gold dropping, at what point does it become economically feasible for some recovery costs around us now? It depends on the area, I know. Yeah, it depends on the mine. You know, uh, most mines, it, I, I think our best data point is really the fall of 1998. When, I'm sorry, 2008, right? Because gold price fell to about $750, $800 at that time. That was the first time that we really saw a lot of conversations about taking production off the market. And I, if I had to make a guess on a marginal cost of production, I would say it's probably close to that. Because a lot of these mines are very debt or, I mean, they're, they're, they're debt laden, right? So they have to produce, even if they're just servicing debt. And from a rural gold standpoint, that benefits us because if they're producing, then we're getting paid too. So do you have a question? Yeah. What's the dividend yield now and how many companies follow your company? How many animals? Oh, yeah, our dividend yield is about 1.3%. And that's, that's really a function of our valuation just being very, uh, our share price is high, so our yield is 1.3. Uh, and we have, I think, about 15 banks who cover us right now. How does, how does your stock trade? Is it actively traded or is it stuff? Yeah, it is. So we have, you know, we have, we've been in business since 1981. We only have 65 million shares outstanding. Uh, but in the course of the day, um, with our $4.5 billion market cap, it's not unusual for us to move 50 or $60 million a day in volume. So um, our liquidity is quite good. And we are trading in the U.S., thanks, Garrett. Yeah, we're the only U.S. domicile company in our business. Um, the, other, the other two are Canadian domiciled. So we get definitely a benefit from that. So we sit in a lot of the, we, obviously we're a mid-cap, so we end up in a lot of, we're in a lot of mid-cap funds, and then we're also, um, we end up having a bit more liquidity than the Canadian peers. Yes. How much of the company is management on, and who are the major shareholders? Sure, great question. Let's see. So management owns a little less than 3% of the company, and we are heavily incented with performance shares. And our performance shares only vest if we achieve 10% uh, growth and adjusted free cash flow per share, which is effectively an EBITDA measure. And we have not vested those in the last three years because the gold price, frankly, has not given us the lift um, in, the, in the EBITDA per share that we would have liked. It's been pretty steady, but we haven't, which is great, because actually our EBITDA has been pretty steady relative to the gold price declining, but we haven't had the lift that we um, had anticipated. And we think that's okay, because that's aligning with our shareholders as well. Uh, we are about 88% institutionally held. We don't have a whole lot of... Uh, retail. We do have quite a, quite a bit of uh, family and private office um, ownership in our shares, but it's mostly institutionally held. Because our business is somewhat unusual and it's, it's difficult, as you can see, to kind of introduce to people, so we tend to have more of an institutional following than we do a retail following. Any other questions? So, so why, why a royalty streaming business versus just owning the, the actual metal? you think the metal price is going to go up? Yeah, so, well, you could own the metal if the price is going to go up, but in terms of an investment decision? Well, you have a couple of decisions, right? Because, do you, first of all, do you want a dividend? Because we'll pay a dividend and, and the metal will not. Um, and also, you know, we'll have, the, we'll have the exploration upside associated with our counterparties converting more resources into reserves and hopefully generating more cash flow for us. So we like being in our business, and that's, we think that's the biggest differentiator from owning, owning the physical. But we know a lot of people are very comfortable owning the physical, and actually some of our cash we actually keep in physical gold. Yeah. I have a question. Um, 
What percentage is gold, silver, copper, and the New York commodities they have? What is it? Yeah, so we are about 73% gold and about 8% uh, silver. And then the balance is nicker, nickel, copper, cobalt, lead, and zinc. We, uh, we endeavor to be about 75% gold. And then the rest base metals, because a gold company will typically trade at a premium to a non-gold company, and so we don't want to lose that premium. Yes. Are the other PMGs calculated in with the profits? Are the other what? PMGs, precious metals? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, are they calculated in with the profitability of the uh, company? Yeah, they are. So we do a gold, we basically just, we gross it up so it's a gold equivalent basis, gold equivalent ounce. Yes. Yeah. Did you hedge your price at all or did you just uh, do a market price? You know, we don't hedge our prices. We, we have a bank in at least once every six months that's, that's, you know, asking us if we'd be interested in doing that. We don't do it because our investors like the, like the exposure to gold. And so we don't do it, but we've definitely seen um, in the past other companies in the gold business engage in that. We just choose not to. Do you have an internal like dividend policy as far as tied to cash flow or something? We don't have a policy. I know some other companies do. We just have a commitment to growing it every year. So it's got to grow every year, and uh, you know this year we increased at five percent. So other than that, it needs to grow every year. No, and then we have to sustain it. So even if the gold price falls a lot, we have that dividend uh, obligation, and I, we, we think that's good. We think it sets a good discipline for us. Let me ask you a question. You only have 40 people in the company. Yes. Who does the research for you? Uh, in terms of due diligence, uh, well, we have about six employees that do nothing but due diligence. And then we have a group of uh, about six or seven contractors that are actually my boss's old bosses who have seen mines all over the world. And we actually have them on retainer. And we will actually send them out on due diligence trips. And then they'll actually compile their due diligence independent of our internal people. And then we'll put them together in an investment committee meeting, which is a very interesting process to determine you know, if we both arrive at the same conclusion. And if not, to challenge each other's assumptions. That's been a really, uh, for, for Royal Gold standpoint, that's been a really powerful process. And I think it's resulted in us making some, some good decisions and hopefully avoiding some investments that, didn't, that would not have worked out. Yeah. You seem to have quite a bit of a relationship with Gold Corp. <coughs> Is that your opinion of their management and their financial position that they're top in the industry? It's an interesting question. Like, like my CEO, Tony Jensen, the CEO of Gold Corp also came from a company called Placer Dome that was a very successful mining company that was purchased, I think, in 2005 by Barrick. If you look at the people in the gold mining business who have made money, who have been really successful, who have a great deal of professional discipline, it's fascinating how many of them came out of Placer Dome. And I think that, that I think they have that culture that has really resulted in them also. They're, they're very lean. You know, when I worked at Newmont, I remember calling Gold Corp and just calling their front office to assess how many people they had in their head office because we just couldn't believe how few people they said that they had. And it was indeed true how few people they said they had in their head office. So, you know, we have a lot of respect for them. As operators, uh, they have successfully executed, and as acquirers of new mines, they've been very savvy. So, we have a very high opinion of them as, as partners. And that's probably why they're at the top. If you look at that list of market caps, um, you know they, they are, I believe, the most valuable uh, precious metals company. It took an 8% discount yeah. to that enforcement. Yes. But if you read, I know they missed earnings, but if you, read, if you actually read their release and you look at the amount of upside they have in front of them, they've got... Um, a nice a nice road ahead of them and probably a very strong 2015 because they guided higher on almost all their production guidance. So I think they were punished a bit today for missing the EPS number, but I think the core story was pretty strong. It's a great question. That was one of the things delaying today. Oh. It's not like you're being my first Oh. <laughs> Understood. Yeah. What percentage of the mines would you say are in uh, less developed countries? And, and what kind of risk uh, that poses? Uh, in the gold business or just in the mining business in general? Oh, in our business? 
oh gosh, uh, I wouldn't know exactly how many are in developing countries, but it's a, it's a large number. Because if you look at where, it's interesting though, I mean, you can't discount Canada. Canada has really become a force in this business because it is such a supportive industry for mining. Uh, however, what's opened up a lot in the recent years has really been the African countries. West Africa is a very popular place to do business. And, and I used to work for Numa, it's a very, very um, favorable place to do business. You'll also see that you know, you've got your traditional mining strongholds like Australia that continues to be very, um, very active. Central and South America, it really depends on, the, and it depends on the political regime, really, and whether they're supportive of mining or not. And so that tends to wax and wane despite the great mining history that you'll see in South America. So you know, in South America, Chile and Argentina used to be very supportive of mining. Argentina, not so much now. And Chile sort of um, you know, kind of ebbs and flows with how they're feeling about the mining business. So political risk is really important. And I think that's why we tended to focus on a limited number of companies. I can tell you that to do this investment in Macedonia with Euromax we just did required extensive due diligence, hiring a local attorney in Macedonia, and also meeting with the Macedonian ambassador that our CEO met with personally, and then hiring Madeleine Albright's agency in Washington, D.C. to do some due diligence work for us. So that kind of greenfields opportunity in a developing country is something we we're really careful about, but we don't shrink from. We're not afraid of it. Right. There's, there's no way of hedging or insuring against that risk, right? That, that's cost effective, right? So. You know, they, there is political risk insurance, but for us to take on political risk insurance is probably going to hose our rate of return, unfortunately. So I think the miner themselves will often will often get political risk insurance because it'll probably be a covenant if they're going to take on any kind of, it'll be probably be a requirement if they take on any kind of debt. But from our standpoint as a provider of capital, it usually doesn't make sense for us to do that. Not to say that we don't run the traps on that almost every time because we do. So I don't want to never say never. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. If you have a 75% goal, what's your ranking point, your cost in gold? Is it what's your Sure. So we can operate very successfully if the gold price falls a great deal because we only we have very low fixed cost. Our GNA uh, annually is slightly over twenty million dollars a year, and most of that are due diligence cost. Our headcount's probably less than half of that. It's really the the outside consultants and attorneys and so forth that we use for due diligence. So we could cut that off if we needed to. But most of our mines, if they are a copper mine, you know. Anywhere between a dollar fifty call it and two dollar copper starts to get a little problematic for them, and from a gold standpoint, probably between six hundred and eight hundred dollar gold results in them having to seriously consider whether they want to continue to to produce or not. Again, if they have debt service requirements, they may be required to continue to produce, but that's really where we would start getting nervous. So twelve hundred dollars, we still feel pretty good. But your costs are fixed. Our costs are fixed. Uh, like 350. Um, well, on a stream, our costs are fixed. If we pay 435 an ounce, yeah. But yeah, our effective 350 an ounce is, is what we've paid for the for the portfolio effectively. Yeah, but it's a little over our our total fixed cost per year. Like our GNA is really all we have, and that's 20 million dollars a year. But again, over half of that I would define as more variable because it's it's outside consultants and. Uh, folks that we could let go if we needed to that are not employees. But other than our lease and our headcount, that's pretty much the cost of running Royal Gold. <laughs> and some attorneys outside. Yes? What are the trends in the Dominican Republic? Are they a little stronger, a little less confiscatory than they were a couple years ago? <laughs> Well, that's a great question. So if you're unaware, Dominican Republic has, is home to a very large mine called Pueblo Viejo, which is the joint venture between Gold Corp and Barrick. And about, I guess it was about two years ago, after being a very supportive of the development, they sort of came out of nowhere and asked for, I believe, they, they threatened to pull their permits uh, if they did not pay a larger royalty, I believe, or some, they changed the tax structure a bit. So things have settled down there a bit from what, we've, what we understand. However, you do see governments acting sometimes, um, I wouldn't say rashly, but unexpectedly when they need to raise revenue. And occasionally, the, mining, the international mining company is a convenient place to go, right? So Tahoe Resources operates in Guatemala. They have a large silver mine. It's one of the largest in the world. And in December, uh, out of nowhere, the legislature enacted a 10% royalty on them overnight. 
and there's really not a lot of recourse for that. And it's, it's a very delicate balance. And that's why, you know, I don't know that the folks in the mining business 20 years ago had to have um, a, a great domain expertise in international relations, but they do now. And the government relations piece is, is really important. Which company was that in Guatemala? That was Tahoe Resources. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Great. Well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, it has a very strong correlation. It's about a 0.91 correlation. However, during 2014, when gold underperformed, Royal Gold actually outperformed. And over that time, Royal Gold has outperformed gold. We have. Yeah, we have consistently outperformed the, me the metal. That's correct. Largely because of the growth profile. We just have a growth profile that gold can't, can't match. Yeah, thank you.